there we go. Um, so as I say, Kathy, Kathy was with us back in um, July and has very kindly agreed to come back and speak to us. And uh, Kathy's background, as, as some of you will, will know, is she's an organizational um, and, and leadership development facilitator. And she's got a wealth of experience um, across a lot of different sectors. So without wanting to steal her thunder, Kathy, I'm going to pass over to you. Um, and if you need uh, polls or breakouts or anything like that, just let me know and we, we can get that sorted. Great. Okay, thanks Judith, that's rushing. And well, welcome everybody, and um, thank you for having me back. I was um, chatting with Judith um, before everybody joined, and I was saying that how I've sort of defined these days that obviously I'll do some presentation, but I really want to try and tap into your experiences of developing people remotely. Because when I was thinking about what we did in July and what difference I could add now. I've got a few different things, but I thought actually what we really want to do is to see how you've all tackled it and share good ideas. So what I'm going to do is, obviously I'll go through the presentation, I'm going to take it sort of in sections and then we'll kind of stop. And I'm going to ask you then maybe to put your contributions into chat because I think there'll be, um, far too many of you to actually speak. I think it would just be an absolute nightmare um, there, but maybe at the end of the session, if people want to actually talk about some things in a bit more detail, we can do that if there's, if there's time. But I was saying to um, Judith as well, is that if you're interested, we can also save the chat as well as the recording so that you can actually see what everybody has put in and pick up on any ideas that other people have. So hopefully that um, sounds good. And I'm, I must admit, I'm quite excited to see what you've all got to say about um, how things have gone. So I'm just going to um, kick off on my um, slides. So I'll just call that up. There we go. Come on, that's it. Um, and the session is called uh, Developing People Remotely, and that's what we're going to uh, talk about. But um, just a reminder, I'm sure, I'm just laughing at this when I saw this slide because I, I kept it in from July, but I actually thought, you know, none of us probably need any teaching about being in Zoom anymore. But um, so just to say, if you... Um, want to type please type in chat and there's a little icon for it you can raise a hand if you do want to speak but actually because it's going to be on so many different screens um it might be very difficult to to pick that up because things fall. so please only do that if you really really um need to obviously physically raising a hand can work if if people can see you as well but chat is probably the most foolproof way of doing it so I wanted to start off, first of all, with kind of saying, well, how's it going? Because in July, we talked about ways of developing people, um, kinds of technology you might want to think about, maybe some of the principles in terms of looking at learning solutions and all of that kind of thing. So what I would like you to do is just in chat now, this is a very sort of, um, quick poll, type in just the number of where you feel you are. So, if, I mean, hopefully nobody's the number one, but if you really feel that in your organization or the areas that you're responsible with, developing people has gone backwards, type in a one. Right up to the other end, if you think, hey, we're being really creative, we're doing some really good stuff here that we want to um, actually cling on to when, when everything gets back to how it was, um there so could you just quickly now type in chat whichever number you think reflects where you are on that continuum and we'll just have a quick view and judith's going to help me just catch that okay i would say predominantly threes and fours i haven't seen anything but a three or a four kathy Brilliant. Well, that is excellent. I mean, and I'm sure people who are saying they're trying are being quite modest, but that is really, really good. Thanks, Judith. That, that, that's great. Um, 
I think to me that reflects everything that I felt from the organizations I've been working with or people I've been talking to as well which I think is a real credit to HR that um, we've actually not kind of sat back and gone oh well isn't everything awful but we've actually tried to do things okay well those of you that are trying and those of you that are doing something we'll have a chance for you to put in um, and share the sorts of things that you're doing did anybody do just put in a five have you seen any fives a no, people just threes and fours quite a lot of fours though oh good no, no fives. that's excellent yeah excellent okay um right move this on now hopefully this doesn't need any um introduction to people but i thought it was a really good basis for all the things you need to think about when you're developing people it's the training development cycle and it's you know the old favorite and when we talked in july those of you that were at that session we really focused around designing and selecting a solution and we did a little bit about delivering it because we looked at um maybe sort of criteria for what things it was mainly around um this last aspect so when I was planning today, I thought, actually, I'd quite like to focus a bit more on the identifying needs and on the evaluating. But we will skip through this as well, because I think I'm interested to know what people have done um, there as well. And obviously, the important bit is the organisational objectives that they have to feed in to all of this. So one of the tricky things with developing people is that we're working as you know at individual team department level maybe even and certainly organizational level so it all becomes really quite a complex picture and a lot of what your needs are or what your design parameters are or any of these things are absolutely based at what level you're going in are you dealing with an individual or are you dealing with an organization wide need at, at the other end and everything in between. So just again, don't want to teach grandmothers to suck eggs, but I think it's quite useful just to remind ourselves about what we mean by um, a learning need. And obviously that's a gap in skills or knowledge which needs to be addressed. And the kind of useful diagram is this one really, that, you know, where are you now? Where do you want to be? The, current level of competence, the desired level of competence, and what the gap is in between. Now, when I was um, thinking about this, I thought, you know, it's quite interesting because one of the things that might be influencing developing people remotely is, are the kind of required or desired levels of competences different than they were before lockdown? Now that might be something very obvious, just like you know, um, IT skills or digital awareness and other things. But in fact, it could be around a lot of the soft skills, because I'm sure you've all found this. Some people, just in terms of their um, qualities or personality or whatever, find it much easier to operate well in this virtual environment and other people find it much more challenging and if actually you know we've been here for gosh i've lost track of how many months is it nine months that we've been in and yeah we had good news about the vaccine today but i was also listening to an expert that said yes but it might be six months still before everything kind of unrolls so we're certainly around for a fair bit yet so i think that you know some of the um, important bits so it's understanding what your your learning needs are and then the other sort of tricky bit is actually where do you get your information from on what your learning needs are now none of this is any different in the digital world or in the non-digital world the principles are all the same but it may be that the needs are slightly different or that your sources of information are slightly different. And that's the kind of thing that um, I, I'd be interested to explore with you in, in, in a minute. So I've just made a list here of loads of them, and there's probably things missing that, that you use um, as well. 
obviously right up at the organisation level, your business plans, your um, values, etc., etc., around organisation plans like succession and so on, right down to you know job specs, person specs. You may be doing a skills audit, you may not. That kind of stuff might have gone on the back burner um, while we've been in lockdown. But there'll be lots of kind of mandatory training and things like that that possibly have to keep going. So um, education training goes on and so on. Then right down to, I've kind of put that with the learner interview and the manager interview, which I think we've always thought of as being really, really important in terms of identifying needs. Um, how is that impacted by those having to be done virtually? Or are our relationships across the digital line uh, slightly different? So, first little stage to answer things. For you, how, what have you found are the challenges of identifying learning needs remotely? And if you've overcome them, bung those ideas in and we can have a wee look. And what I'm going to do is maybe just come out so I can have a look at the chat. Um, while you do that, oops. So if people can just type in any any experiences that they've had there. All a bit quiet. <laughs> am I am I missing them, Judith? Or no? No. No, there's nothing there. Right. One one thing that I've noticed is that you know often you you in, in the workplace you can see where people are struggling, and that's harder yeah. to see when they're working remotely. Yeah. So that's possibly a chat. Oh, we've got a few coming in now. Yeah. Um, chat challenges with connecting with a large workforce, miss, miss out on informal chats. Which is kind of the point you were making, yeah. Judith. This bit about all the unquantifiable feelings if you like that you get yeah yeah can be hard to get the same level of interactivity yeah good those of you that are just be a bit unfair the ones that have typed something else um have you done even anything to try and overcome these because it seems to be quite a common theme coming through the challenges actually how valuable all the informal channels are in terms of identifying needs, supporting people, even informal development. Because I mean, as they say, you know, 70% of, of development is probably stuff that you just learn on the hoof as you're working with, with colleagues and so on. Um, so Fiona, is it said you've, had, you've done a staff survey program? Right, somebody's saying about create, creative, unique solutions, yeah. so. That's quite an interesting one there. Do we need to start thinking about, do we use the technology we've got to personalise solutions? I think um, you were saying there. Okay, and Rachel is, is talking about open door informal meetings, which is quite good. So you, I, I guess, Rachel, you set them up digitally on, on you know, the meeting, but it's, it's informal. Yeah, she's saying yeah. yes, they do do that. Yeah, good. I, I, that's, I, I really like that, actually. That's a really good idea to try and replicate kind of corridor chat and things like that that we were talking about was um, missing. That, that, that's great. There's quite yeah. a few people saying that it's, it's hard because everything appears to be a priority at the moment and, that, and that's really hard um, to keep up with that, which I think is, is a fair point. And lots yeah. of people still feel they're firefighting even though we're sort of nine months on. Yeah, and that's right. And I think this bit about, you know, um, it's funny, I was talking to somebody yesterday about this, about how um, one of the things I've experienced in, in, in this period is we don't look forward. We just kind of, you know, because the future is so uncertain, we just manage today. But as I think, um, you know, Lisa was saying about the firefighting, but also, developmental training is always looking forward and I think we've just been in a mindset of managing where, where we are. Yeah, and um, Louise is kind of saying 
trying to create the time and space rather than just reacting to things, which is, I think, very difficult because everybody's running to keep up anyway um, there. Yep, and Susan's saying that development training is changing. We need new models, not the old old school management development. Yeah. And Dawn is saying social care is predominantly about physical connection, so that makes it a challenge. However, we've been impressed with employees' willingness to give it a go with virtual learning. Mm. Um, and, and you need to be an IT expert, you know, that that is the <laughs> issue. <laughs> we all feel that. <laughs> yes, I know, unfortunately. That's great, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. I'm conscious that we've only got a short time, so we'll move on. But if you get some inspiration, stick it in anyway. But I think there's some really, really good points there. Some comfort is that I think everybody is having the same experiences. So it's not that it's like your particular organisation that's suffering. But there's also this message, I think, coming through that let's just use this opportunity to change how we do things for the future even when we maybe don't need to do things virtually but there's a lot of advantages to there so great that's 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 super okay um maybe this will move on in a minute don't know why it suddenly decided to do that right design and delivery um a couple of things were, were um picked up there one of them i thought was quite interesting um i can't remember the name of the person said that but said it's quite challenging when you're doing a, a subject like social care, which is really about interaction and caring for people and so on, and that you're actually having to deliver it in, in, in remotely and so on. So I've called this recap because it was pretty much um, what we um, covered in um, July, but I thought I would just stick the slides up again, a couple of slides, just quickly, in case people weren't there and so on. But we did talk, if we remember, and spent quite a while saying there's loads of different learning technologies and maybe we should be trying to think about how we use some of these things, even down to, you know, fun things like, you know, apps on smartphones and all this kind of thing, even getting down to virtual reality. And don't, <laughs> I'm not a virtual reality expert in any sort of way in, in games and so on or other realities. But again, if we're looking at ways that we can kind of simulate interaction, then there, there is stuff there. I think some of the issues for people are, um, as we've already said, um, people's IT skills and also cost um, for some of these very super duper ones. Some are cheap, but I think that's a real issue. And that's something that maybe as a whole industry, it, we need to be looking um, at that. Um, virtual classrooms, I think, can work very well, but they can be disastrous as well. And so much of it, I think, is dependent on the um, vehicle that you're using. You know, I've used some that have just been terrible, you know, that so Zoom is actually, seems to, by and large, work quite well, the sound is good and everything else. I've been on some that have just been awful. So there's loads and loads of hiccups there that I'm sure people have um, uh, experienced. Um, and we talked about content and we spoke, spoke quite a lot about text and interactive text and using videos and simulations and all of these kinds of things, all of which I'm sure you're quite familiar with. But again, it's um, picking and choosing the ones that are actually going to, to work for people. But there are also, as we talked about last time, quite a lot of cheap options. I'm not saying you spend your time on YouTube. YouTube has got some excellent um, video links and things that are really useful and fun. And it's just a matter of trying to be creative about how those are um, used. So what I'm interested then in, same thing again, design and delivery, what challenges and how have you overcome them? We start, some of that came into the identifying needs, but maybe we could look at this a bit better. I mean, for example, one of the challenges I've come across with people is that if you don't, with some online courses, if you don't do absolutely everything as it should be, even if you completed the course, it doesn't register as completed. And if this is a mandatory course that you have to do for your organization, then it can be problematical. So 
Anybody got anything they'd like to come in? So this is really thinking about you designing learning or development and delivering it and any challenges. So thing on, and things that worked well as well, things that you've overcome. Any inspirations coming up here? I think the, challenge, the first challenge we've got is, is time because everybody's so busy with work and so it's not always on their radar, which I think is a really good point, actually. Yeah. So everybody's That's busy right. to keep ahead, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, and then Susan's saying, just adding to that, about finding new just-in-time methods of delivery. Yeah, so that people can get it just right when they need it instead of thinking, oh, God, I've got to do that, you know, awful thing. Um, I also think, um, back to my point about design and delivery and some of the ideas there, it, it's development time, time to develop the new materials. It's fine if you combine off the plane, but, but you know, do your L&D departments or your people that are responsible for L&D have time to think about it? It's quite easy to you know, plan a wee face-to-face -face session and get it out of the way. Um, all oh, right, that's that's interesting one from Dawn as well. That things that have worked well before don't work virtually. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, Dawn, I don't know if you can answer that specifically, but why did that um, increase the learning? Um, do you think that when somebody did it as an individual, they actually learned more than they had as a group exercise? Do, no. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer verbally because it's quicker than talking, if yeah, that's all right. Uh, yes, yes. Um, basically, what was happening was people were um, relying on others in their group, so they weren't really absorbing the learning. Um, right. But when they did it for themselves, they did yeah. have to apply the thinking and the logic to it, um, and they had to kind of own what they didn't know. Yeah. So by doing it independently, they actually learnt more from the experience. Yeah, no, that's good. And Laura was talking about kind of it, um, using breakout rooms and being quite immediate about things. And I think that is quite interesting. And I think um, certainly one of my personal experiences about actually using Zoom or similar and using breakout rooms and things as opposed to the old face-to-face -face facilitation is it's much more disciplined. Actually, it's a trainer. You've got much more control because you just press the button and they've all got to come whizzing back in again and so on. So it is interesting. It's different, but it's... Um... So Rachel, on training videos, yeah, okay. Yeah, making training, delivery more interactive using the tools. Yeah, um... Lisa, that's a really good point I think you've made. I think the biggest learning thing for me was how tiring it is doing things on, online, you know, in Zoom or whatever method you use. So when you could have had a three-hour workshop, um, you just can't have that online. People just, um, you know, fade out, really. So I found that it's quite a good discipline to think about how do you focus, you know, as a trainer now, how do you focus in and get your messages across? Yeah, that, that, that's it. just the legit, Lynn's just really kind of talking about the logistics of delivering things there as well. I think it's a good point you make, Cathy, about, uh, you know, the, the sort of screen fatigue, because what I've seen is that, you know, where you're delivering, if you're delivering it virtually, you've got to bear in mind that the rest of their day, the chances are they're spending a huge proportion of it online as well. Yeah. You know, and, it, and it's, it's not that just the learning is going to be online. Most of the meetings and things like that are like that yeah. as well. So it is, it's, it's, it's possibly about spacing it out or trying to, to save some time if you can do that, that, that specific learning time. Yeah. So that it's not impacted, you know, it's, it's maybe a day where you've got less other meetings so that it's yeah. not all... Um, screen based. Yeah. I also think that there, I think that that's absolutely right, Judith, and it's being, it's really thinking about things. Um, 
Oh, Lynn, you're saying deliv when delivering solar, it becomes impossible to do live breakout rooms on MS Teams. Is that just the logistics in terms of getting in and around the different breakout rooms? Yeah. yeah. But um, one of the things I was going to say, I'm just it's gone out of my head now, <laughs> something from what Judith had said, and it just, um, it'll come back to me when we're, we're talking about things in terms of, of um, delivery. But yeah, there's lots of things that we've learned. And um, what I think is quite interesting is that there are things that we've learned in terms of taking things forward and differently in the future. I think one of the pitfalls that I find very difficult to overcome is on an online delivery, not ending up doing loads and loads of talking. Because when you've got a group of people in front of you, I don't know if the rest of you feel like this, it's so much easier to say, oh, Judith, what do you think? You know, they're there and they're right in front of you. Because you've got to be much more disciplined online, it becomes harder, I think. And um, I found I've had to be quite creative in thinking about how do I stop myself talking all the time um, there. So, uh, yeah. Keeping short and somatic training has worked well. And linked into that, I think, is my point about um, the learning needs and the point that somebody raised about making it the just-in-time training. If it's stuff that's really relevant, people will take it on. It doesn't have to be relevant in terms of very mechanical for now. The development can be in there. But if we're really understanding what's making people tick, um, Traditional, yeah, actually, that's quite interesting. Claire's saying, that in fact, Zoom's an improvement on e learning, yeah, and I think there's, there's a lot in that, um, as well. Which got me to think, I mean, how do you feel? You know, one of the things that we all learn is that everybody's got different learning styles, and you have to try and incorporate that into or when you're planning development for people. How do you think? Does anybody had any thoughts about how? people's different learning styles impacts virtual learning or is impacted by virtual learning? Group size being problems. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, that's that's it. So anybody got any comments on learning styles? Yeah, so people that, um, if it's very process um, driven, it's hard for people because the virtual learning lends itself to focusing on, on processes and so on. Um, John saying about it being debunked, I, I don't agree actually, well, my, that's my view, I'm not an expert. But I think people do learn in different ways. I'm not saying they can't learn in different ways, but they certainly have preferred ways. I mean, you know, some people are quite happy to read a lot of material and take information in that way. But other people, that is just out the window. They just can't concentrate. And I think we understand that people are, you know, have different, just like people have different ways of working or approaching tasks. I think they have different ways of, of learning. I mean, I don't think people are trapped in a learning style, but I think um, it's there. So yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't feel, I feel that that is a real factor still. Yeah, in, I think it's a good point that think. Susan makes that, it, that quiet people, she's found that quiet people interact more um, in a virtual environment than they do in a big group. And I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I, I've noticed that, that people who I, would normally not expect to say much, say uh -huh. much more over Zoom, even if even if it's just in the chat box. But often their, their camera's not on, but they'll still be speaking, which is great. Yeah. So yeah. do you think that's because there's a protection for the shy people there, Judith? Yeah, I yeah. I, I do definitely, definitely. Yeah. 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 Breaking things down into chunks. All right, that's interesting, Rachel saying that, which is kind of what you were talking about in terms of shy people, but that people who are perhaps have autistic um, characteristics or whatever, actually barriers are broken down that way, which is really uh, interesting. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and there's Catherine saying that she thinks shy people hide more. So it's yeah, <laughs> well, that's right. It's, and I guess it's like with everything. There's probably two sides to every tale, and it's. Uh, I'm conscious we're about halfway through time, so I'm just going to move on so that we've got time to um, pick up to other things. But that's really good. Thanks everybody for for that um, because it's really useful to to get your feedback on there. So the next bit. Come on, you. <laughs> Focusing the slides to go on. Right, evaluation. So my first question here really is, oh, why bother? I mean, you don't have to answer that. I don't mean it as a, as a thing. But why I've put that there really is that um, evaluating learning and development is the biggest weakness any of us have as L&D professionals or as organizations or whatever because it's difficult it's really really difficult and i'm really interested to know um has if has evaluation and how you're evaluating or what you're thinking about measuring or any of these things has it changed because you're developing um virtually and one of the things i just put up this slide in terms of recap we talked quite a lot about this in my last um, um session about the fact that um pitfalls of digital learning or remote learning or whatever you want to to call it is is i'll just put it around there you know it can be bureaucratic and flexible thinking is you just churn something out for everybody you the learner isn't there in front of you so you can kind of forget about them lack of engagement and so but in fact all the examples that you've been talking about um when we're talking about design and delivery have actually um not been talking about that you've actually been showing ways that you've been actually really engaging people being flexible and so on which is great but i guess these are things that we would be wanting to look out for if we were um, evaluating things but also um, we talked last time about um, what we thought made a good online learning session and people came up with other suggestions as well but we just talked about you know planning and the right time and um, being interactive lots of you have talked about trying to be clever about how you 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 make things interactive and interesting how you make it accessible so how do you stop technology getting in the way um, and so on that it's reliable and so on and making sure that you're prepared so stuff works basically i think and people know what the rules are etc and the other bit i think we need to think about is as always with um, evaluation there are different stakeholder needs so obviously the learner is you know very important but they're not the only um figure in, in in the thing so the the trainer or the um learning development team or whatever it is external providers certainly management line managers senior management and so on awarding bodies and so on um regulatory bodies all of these kinds of things at different level and possibly even shareholders and things depending on what your organization um, is like so i would again like to ask you all the question about I mean, we all know what the challenges are of evaluating learning full stop, and none of us, I think, have actually really overcome them um, in really well. But are there any particular challenges about doing it remotely? And have you had any bright ideas about um, getting around these? The first point, if I, I, I can just, because Don's already put it in the chat, is that they, they've moved to using online evaluation and they use SurveyMonkey, and, and that's what we use for, for these events as well. Yeah. Um, whilst evaluations are really positive they don't get the same volume because they've not got the cat you're relying on people doing it as opposed to when they're physically in the room yeah um, and and so it's, it's easier to see where people in the room it's easier to see where people haven't fed back whereas when you're doing it online it's harder to do yeah i mean i think we all know that as trainers don't we you know you don't get out of the room until you've done your evaluation for um but then equally I always suspected that 
you know, when people did it there and then right in front of you, did they just kind of tick whatever to get let out of the room and probably were perhaps more positive. So maybe, although you don't get the volume, as Dawn's saying, maybe what you get is more accurate and reliable feedback. And, and, and Dawn's seeing that actually. Yeah, Dawn, you're exactly that point, yeah. 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 Uh, Oh, that's an interesting one that Susan's put there um, about the fact that um, you can adapt as you go along. And, oh yeah, I've just missed John's there. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. So, because you've got, is it John, because you've kind of got more plan maybe planning and control over doing things online it's easier than to keep the organizational perspective would that be it um they seeing some what to that kathy all right okay <laughs> no, no i think <laughs> yeah. i think we're all not a fan of happy mm. sheets but um uh that's right, and I think it's back to identifying the learning need process as well. That's why the training cycle is so important, is are we evaluating what we actually set out to deliver or are we just bringing out something um, there? MS All right, that's interesting. People, um, Rich using MS Forms. Um, yeah, because people can't be anonymous in, in the classroom perhaps, and that's, that's right. Um, yeah, good. Any other things that people have found difficult or good or or in between? I quite like the idea of um, really, I guess what we're saying is that if you're doing things digitally, there is an opportunity to be more flexible. I think somebody was talking about that you can adapt um, as you go along. And actually, can we be more flexible with our evaluations? And, and that kind of brings out some of the points that John and others have been making about, uh, you know, can we evaluate things that we really need to evaluate? Oh, polls, Rachel, yeah, getting a quick response. Um, and yeah, actually, I think that's a really good function of Zoom, actually. I like the polls on Zoom. I think that's a great yeah. way of getting feedback. Yeah. And it's fun anyway, people quite like doing that and seeing the results and things, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. How, how have your evaluations been panning out? Have you found that people have been more positive about some aspects of what you're delivering, less positive? Um, Anything there that, you know, is it, if you've seen any trends happening? And the other thing I wondered too, is if we think about my slide about um, evaluation for different stakeholder needs, um, have you you have has it all been just evaluating with learners or have you been using the on i mean i know that very often it's quite difficult to get managers to feedback um on effectiveness of training that their um teams have been on or anything like that has anybody seen any improvements or anything that's made it easier to get perhaps those different levels of evaluation coming back Oh yeah, that, I, Catherine is saying that people have like not having to travel and that actually is quite interesting because that's kind of outside of um, maybe some of the specifics but it's very important particularly in our area um, that um, sometimes you know 
especially if your organisation is spread right across, say like NHS or um, council or anything like that, people actually have to travel quite a good way to to feed in and attend. And that can be actually just a really, you know, downside of, of the training. Okay, so that's, so Leslie's saying that that's interesting that in fact actually using external mechanisms to look at, at, at what you're doing um, and the quality review and, that's, and you know that's exactly what we should be doing lately I mean obviously we, we should ask learners about how they're experiencing things um, but also um, is it delivering what we want it to deliver in the end right so more focused on the transfer of learning that's it so actually are they doing things differently in the workplace because they've been on the learning so dawn you're not seeing a change in management engagement really okay yeah and actually that's a good point there about the distractions at home um, people remembering that they're um, at work. All right, so sorry, John, did I misunderstand that, that you're saying that it's actually been positive, um, your support from managers for things? Yeah, we, we've always had really good um, connections with the service managers, so there's good. always been a good interaction. And if there is an issue that we identified during training, we can pick that up with them so they follow through in supervision, yeah. but also in practice monitoring. Yeah, oh, well, that's good because I think you're quite like, lucky there because certainly my um, experiences have um, can quite often been different than that too, but that, that's really good. And I just wondered if maybe digital made it a bit easier. Okay. Um, it's just, oh, I don't know why this is struggling to move on. There we go. Just then um, to, um, I want to leave some time for just general chat and questions and, and so on at the end. But just generally to come back, I mean, we started by looking at identifying needs. And what I didn't see, I don't think, and maybe I um, missed that, is any particular needs that have grown out of being in lockdown or working from home or anything you know there are they're obviously the, the standard learning development needs that you have um i just wonder if if that's been a case for anybody if, have you had to address things that are particularly as an impact of perhaps um new ways of working because of the virus or anything like that Resilience, lots of it, yeah. Um, that's quite an interesting one because um, if we're identifying, I mean, if we're identifying people's kind of need for, for resilience, which I guess we can make as, uh, uh, oh, lots of IT, <laughs> yeah, lots of it, yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry, Rachel, that's really, really that wrongly. Um, yeah, and, and, um, and I think these are things that they're opposite ends of the spectrum, aren't they? Oh, Lynn's raised a hand, I think, Judith. Um, I don't know if you want to say something, Lynn. No. Maybe she can't hear, I don't know. The hand came, but maybe it was an accident. <laughs> No. If, if it's easier folks you know if you want to um, so it was apologies it was an accident but if, if it's easier just to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question because i think quite sometimes having to type in a lot um, yeah makes it harder and, and certainly i've i'm kind of coming to the the end of everything now anyway and it we open it up really to just for the last five minutes to more kind of general forum um all oh, right, Chris, yeah, I think that's certainly something that um, I've been thinking about, this bit about post-furlough um, and how, how do you do that? Have you, um, 
is that something you've started chris is that is that happening now for you yes yeah, started correct um still trying i guess yeah uh, the, the big portion of our workforce were firewood so i'm um, interested to hear of anyone else having success so far yeah Anybody else got any experiences of bringing staff back after furlough? Oh, a bit quiet. Well, what have you thought of doing, Chris? I mean, or what are you doing? Um, we're we're somewhere between still being a, a virtual workforce and back in the office, and I think that in itself has been quite challenging. You you're getting face time with specific employees but then remote with others so oh. um we are trying to get everyone together as often as possible but then you've got to well the combination of people who are sat in a meeting room socially distant of course mm. but then people on a video screen who mm. are, we've made it mandatory to put your videos on but it's not always uh, possible depending on their own home circumstances shall we say so Mm. I guess it's it's trying to keep the interaction going mm. and learning these we're we're very well it's very early days we we all mm. came back from the uh, second of November so right. Celsius has been quite early in that journey. Yeah. I mean it'll be really interesting I think um to do you know when all this is over to actually almost like do some work to find out what changed when people came because we've never ever had this before and and what impact has it had on organizations and all this kind of thing we really you know did you actually has it changed culture has it changed how you we've all thought about doing stuff and i i'm, I'm sure it's gonna be loads and loads of stuff like that Rachel's really, saying really Kathy that she's found their biggest challenge with reintegrating their furloughed staff is that their it skills have massively declined and at this uh, that's interesting. Members. Yeah, so are you, are you saying, Rachel, that because they've been actually furloughed as opposed from working from home, they haven't been using technology, and I guess other staff who weren't furloughed, perhaps their IT skills have leapt ahead, because we've all got kind of, you know, we're all kind of Zoom experts now, aren't we, or whatever the equivalent is. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Um, unfortunately, I remember our staff came back because she was hurt, she was on caring duties. The rest of us were all still working throughout the pandemic, um, but she, because of family reasons, had to stay home and care for her daughter. Um, and then actually, we launched a new system just before lockdown. So she actually came into a new contract, a new IT system, all eight months later, when we'd all had eight months' experience. Yeah. It was really tough for her, and it's still yeah. is, learning every single day, and it's massively tough for her. Yeah. It's horrible. No, I think that's that's really interesting, and I'm sure there'll be lots of examples like that, or groups of stuff. You know, particularly like Chris was describing, maybe some people were furloughed and some people weren't, depending on the nature of what they were doing. And then actually, they've had a different experience of the organisation, and maybe that kind of you know breaks up the culture a little bit or whatever. We don't really know, and it'll be really interesting to see. But I do think, well, I would think this, but I do think l and is, is almost always the answer to whatever an organisation is trying to do to pull things together. And it's up to all of us, I think, to think about how do we do that? How do we make the transition back to post-COVID really work for everybody, not lose the lessons learned? Because I think there's been huge learning. You know, I feel it just in myself, never mind anything else. And how do we um, tap into that? And I, I think it's I think it's quite exciting, really, in a way. You know, very challenging but exciting. Yeah, Don's made another good point that, that there's been an issue about going back to the office need versus the government guidance versus anxiety, and that she feels that productivity had been better at home versus the office environment. And I think lots of people had commented earlier on about not having to travel for things. And obviously, with mm. where we are situated, we have often got quite a, um, a dispersed workforce and it's it's cut you know working from home has cut down their traveling time so that lets people be more productive because they don't have an hour or an hour and a half's drive at each end of the day yeah 
No, I mean, I think that, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there because, I mean, I know, I, I mean, a lot of organisations I talk to are really having a big think at the moment and saying, you know, do we go back to the way we were or do we actually keep working from home or some, you know, mixed economy of working from home and working from the office and all of this kind of thing. And then how is everything else going to change if that's what happens? But I think the other point that um, Dawn makes, I think, is very, very real, um, is this bit about anxiety. I think everybody um, is quite interesting, I think, because in July, we were still kind of right in the midst of lockdown, weren't we? I think when we had the session, nothing had opened up, or maybe, I can't remember, maybe it slightly opened up, I can't remember. But I just remember when it started to ease, um, during, there was huge anxiety around, even though everybody was pleased Whereas the anxiety wasn't there when we were all completely locked down, but actually as things get a bit less certain and a bit difficult, and now it's really interesting, I think, when everybody's operating on different rules, you know, in Highland we're in a different tier than you are in, in um, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire and so on. Um, and yeah, I think people have um, real anxiety and how do we manage that as, as um, HR people how how do we support staff and everything else like that and I think that's a real challenge yeah um, I think that's going to be a massive challenge actually because uh, and, it, and it's not just because somebody's not anxious doesn't mean to say that somebody else isn't um, yeah uh, and it is it's going to be a real issue I think across the board and I think as well we've talked about this before but everybody's home circumstances are different so hey, for some people it's easier to work from home but equally some people have vulnerable family members and some people don't. So people's anxiety about coming back is impacted by, you know, if they've got a vulnerable, you know, partner or, or child or, or whatever. So um, it's there. Yeah, and then just the protocols when you're at work, you know, keeping the social distancing. I mean, you know, I think Chris was saying, yeah, well, we have these meetings, socially distanced, of course, but I think it's, very very hard you know if you got your two meter rule out you'd probably find that it wasn't it's um it's there um so yeah and i mean really that's that's kind of everything um for me in the sense i mean my last couple of slides are just um a reminder i had these two last time but some kind of useful um resources if you want to um to look at them and obviously CIPD are always updating stuff on their website anyway and ACAS as well and um, oh, I'll get in a minute come on and really I was just going to finish with questions and comments but we'd already got into that but um, I don't know how we're doing we've got well we've got five minutes till shutdown so um, is there anything else that anybody would like to share question, challenge, put out with something for us all to think about or anything else. And you know, feel free to, to do it verbally as opposed to typing because I think we can we can manage that now. I'll just stop sharing and then I'll be able to um, see a few more of you anyway. Um, Yeah. Few faces I know anyway, which is those things. Laura, I know. <laughs> and any other thoughts or comments or anything that you you would like to contribute? Did I miss two chats there? Oh yeah, that's fine. I missed the bit about using Facebook to communicate has gone up that's great so these kind of online newsletter things and so on what I about i just wondered what about organizations as well uh oh susan's so susan can you explain a bit more about that um impact on young people's learning what what you meant by that sure um Hi, um, I'm really enjoying the session. Thank you. It's really great, this discuss discussion version. I guess what I'm interested in is um, 
we we had to cancel our internship program this year and career ready was cancelled mm -hmm. um we got some young people at home and i just wonder how can they learn when they're not in the workplace and they're not being supervised so yes mm. we will go back to some kind of um office environment again hopefully once we've got a vaccine but i think hybrid working is probably here to stay so there's mm. going to be you're not always going to be in the workplace 100%. So I'm just really interested in what does the future look like for um, training and developing young people who maybe haven't always been in a workplace, but possibly got a whole year of young people who haven't been able to, you know, they've missed some learning because they haven't had, a, yeah. a, a, haven't been able to observe the workplace. They haven't been able, they haven't had a mentor or a peer group to 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 sit beside it's, it's something i'm looking at my, in my phd but i'd be really interested maybe if it's something that we can I, i'd love to if we'd had more time i'd have loved to have known more about how the other people on the call are dealing with it but mm -hmm. maybe it's something that judith could pick up again on a, on a future session judith. well i'm just going to say do you know i think yeah. there's a load of mileage in there because um you know what i was thinking you know um i know talking to, to people that that teach at college and, and, and so on, you know, they're doing exactly the same delivering college courses online and, and it's not the same and so on. But what I hadn't really thought about till you said it, Susan, was this bit about, um, we, we've talked about often often, like when you're in the workplace, physically in the workplace, the workplace sends out all sorts of messages about culture, values, expected behavior, all of these things. So one of the beauties about having work placements and internships and so on is that people can um, imbibe all that just by, by being there and they can see that we can, so when we're all working from home, we've had years and years of working in the office. So we've taken all our little workplace routines and culture and things with us. And yeah, I think that's really, really challenging. And um, I, I certainly don't know what the answer to it is. So it would be it would be good to maybe see if there's somebody who's been thinking about this along with you just to, to do that. And what should we as employers in terms of our kind of, if nothing else, our corporate social responsibility be doing to help young people? Because, you know, in many ways they're the biggest losers of everything that's happened over the last you know, over the last year or the pandemic time with school and college and work and and they're probably going into the biggest level of unemployment. I mean, let's not go too, too depressed, but you know, the economy is not going to be bouncing, is it? You know, um, so yeah, I think it's a really, it's a really good one. What can Just we do? Claire's made a point about um, learning from the schools and unis. So uh, the, the PhD I'm doing is with the School of Education at the University of Aberdeen. So uh -huh. there might be somebody there, Judith, that can come and talk about um, what, what they're doing because they're, they're having to completely change everything they're doing and also for placements for students because yeah. everything's there. They can't do the same there. Yeah. I'm going to stop speaking because I know our time's nearly up, but thank you. Yeah, no, no, that, I, think that's, I think that's great. And I'm really interested in this idea of what, what we should be doing as the HR community, if you like, to support that. And before the thing started, we were just chatting about um, uh, children being at school or not at school and all of those kind of things. And actually saying, um, I've been amazed at how creative teachers have been about some of the stuff they've done for students. Okay, maybe some haven't been as good as others, but generally it's been really, really good stuff. That, thanks. So, so again, I think there's quite a lot we can learn from what teachers have done um, to keep kids engaged. So yeah, I think it'd be brilliant. That'd be really good. Anybody else got any kind of particular areas of interest or things that might be worth Kind of flagging up for future discussion because I think that's always good as well. I think it's one of these topics that we could go on and on and on talking about it to be perfectly truthful. Isn't it? <laughs> yes, I know. But it is, do you know what's been really good has actually been the, the amount of input that we've had from the audience today, um, yeah. which is, has been absolutely fantastic. Um, so thank you all very much for that. I'm, I'm very conscious of the time and I'm conscious 
partly because I have somewhere else that I need to. Oh, sorry, Jude, uh, it's me yakking so on. I, 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 I apologise if I'm wrapping it up a bit uh, swiftly, but just to say thank you, Kathy, again, so so much for coming um, and and speaking with us, and thank you everybody for participating. It's been really nice to see you. Um, it's been great to hear what you've been doing, and and keep up the good work. Yeah, exactly. And that's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed today and um, hopefully we can save the chat as well, um, which because I'd just be really quite interested to read it all again properly. Um, just because there was some really good stuff in there. So thanks, everybody. That was, it was a good session. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Nice to see you all. All right.